Let's open our time with a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, particularly during the times of suffering, hardship, and, and trial in our lives. And Lord, we just pray that uh, we may take hold of the antidote that you have given to us in Scripture for dealing with discouragement which comes our way because this is something that uh, afflicts all saints at different times. And Lord, we just see this in the examples that we're going to look at here this morning. So we just ask for your blessing during this time of edification. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The scriptures abound with exhortations to be joyful in the Lord. Right? We, we read that a lot. Particularly in the Psalms. We see here in Psalm 32, for example, in verse 11, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And it picks up there in the first verse of the 33rd Psalm, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. And elsewhere in Scripture, uh, in, in the Psalms, um, we, we find uh, where the psalmist writes this. In the first verse of Psalm 97, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. And again in verse 12, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. We certainly have reason to rejoice. And we find this exhortation to continue by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.4, 4, for example, where he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Also, in the previous chapter, I, I jumped over that one, but Philippians 3, 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then we read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, where he says, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. We may ask, always? Really? How can we do that? You've had a particularly frustrating day. Things didn't go very well at all. And some kind soul comes to you and says, rejoice. And you just kind of give them a dirty look. Or maybe just to avoid any issues, you just kind of look away. Or perhaps you've gone through a very bitter disappointment. And someone comes along saying, be happy. And you just reply, oh, shut up. Why don't you just step a little closer? Let me give you a tap on the jaw. Or perhaps someone going through terrible grief over the death of a loved one. I think there can be probably no greater grief than a mother who's lost a very young child. And the last thing that they want to hear from someone is be joyful. That's neither what they want to hear or what they need, quite frankly. The hurts and the pain of life can weigh heavily upon us. And rejoicing or being joyful in those moments just isn't there. It's not present. And yet James wrote in James chapter 1 and verse 2, Count it all joy! as it's written in the King James, when you fall into diverse temptations. Temptations is, doesn't really, it's not on the nose in terms of that word. In fact, the New King James has that word as various trials. He's writing there of differing afflictions that we go through in life. And why is that? Well, when you read on, you read that God has a couple of purposes there for that. One is for our good, and two is for his glory. Peter also echoes what James wrote in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. He said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, for a short time, if need be, if necessary, you are grieved 
And I like the way the King James words that if you are in heaviness, through various trials, manifold temptations. In fact, in the Greek, the word various means many colored. There are several shades or hues, if you will, when it comes to suffering. We don't all go through the same thing. We all have different experiences in life. We all go through different trials. Women go through sufferings that men do not go through. And we all come from different backgrounds and different places throughout the world. We've got Joanne here is from Haiti, and uh, that's a very rough place to, to be. And uh, we've got others who have come, you know, from, from Mexico and from other locations. And uh, we, we all have had different experiences, some harder than others. And yet, whatever it may be, Peter exhorts us to greatly rejoice I mean, think of the persecution that believers went through in the first and the second century A.D. Being eaten by lions. But he counsels believers saying in verse 8, Whom having not seen you love, speaking of Christ, though you do not see him now yet believing, you rejoice with what? Joy inexpressible. Exuberant joy. You're full of joy. And that's because of the result. Depending on the extent of our travail and agony, we may be inclined to think, yeah, right, Peter, you rejoice and count it all joy. What do you want me to do? Put some smiling face mask over my, my face? Because that's all you're going to get from me. I can't deal with this. It's more than I can take. Peter, later in that letter, wrote in verse 13, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Rejoice to the extent that you are partakers in Christ's sufferings. In other words, you identify with Christ in your trials. Now, he's really talking there about persecution and taking a stand for Christ, which was enormous, but there, there are trials that people can go through that still count for Christ. And I think of Bob's wife, Margie. And uh, you've heard me from time to time bring up Johnny Erickson Tata. And that is a trial that brings glory to the Lord Jesus because they are having to endure day after day after day and yet still maintain joy, gratitude in their hearts, and humility and look forward to their eternal reward. But Peter says rejoice. And you may be sitting there just thinking right now, yeah, 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 okay, I've heard this pep talk before. I'm weary, all right? It's just so stinking hard to struggle day after day after day. I want relief. Give me a break. McDonald's used to have a commercial jingle they sang, you deserve a break today, so get up and get away to McDonald's. Of course, these days, some people need to take a break from the Golden Arches. They've been eating a little too much on Big Macs and French fries. But there's a serious emotion which sets in that many of us struggle with, and that's discouragement. Discouragement, and that's a very real thing. When discouragement festers, it can lead to despondency, to feelings of despair, hopelessness. Discouragement can be hard to shake. And sometimes life feels like we're on this repetitious treadmill and that you're fighting a losing battle. And it seems like you're constantly moving uphill. You never reach the summit and you never get to go back down. You're constantly going up. People often look to those in ministry for comfort and encouragement. They serve as beacons of hope in our troubled society. A little known fact, however, is that pastors and missionaries often, more often than others, are subject to discouragement. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, 
from uh, Great Britain. He said that good men are promised tribulation in this world and ministers may expect a larger share than others that they may learn sympathy with the Lord's suffering people and so may be fitting shepherds of an ailing flock. And that really can be a tall order. A pastor that's worth his salt, who's really engaged in performing the duties that have been entrusted to him, is on call all the time and engaged in a lot, not just in preaching, but in counseling and dealing with problems in helping people when there's a death, conducting funerals, ministering to those who are sick, going to hospitals, uh, visiting those who are in prison. Just There's a whole variety of tasks, not to mention administrative responsibilities with the church. There's a whole lot that is on his plate. You're not punching a clock. And I know that at a certain point in my life, like around my college years, it's kind of like the responsibilities of the ministry really sank in and I wanted to embark upon a flying career and not ministry. The experience of pain and weakness that ministers will experience in particular does create a great deal of empathy for others and God uses that. And repeat, Peter reminds us that this is to be expected. To go back to 1 Peter 4 once again, just before that verse we read about rejoicing to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. He writes in verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. There are really some Christians that need to have this particular passage kind of like stuck in their craw labeled on a phylactery that the Lord spoke of, which would be verses that they, the Pharisees in particular attached to the turban, the hats that they wore and wore on their head or on a wristband or something like that, kind of like these days with quarterbacks in the NFL. They have a, their uh, plays that are on a wristband that they keep on their, their arm. Because Christians can expect to go through trials. That is a given. Just because you're a believer now in Christ doesn't mean that you're going to escape the sufferings in life. If anything, you need to bear in mind that trials are the rule and not the exception. They are the rule, not the exception. But trials and setbacks can weigh heavily upon us and we see examples of godly leaders and individuals whom God ordained, as well as prophets and apostles who succumb to discouragement. And I want to just look at a few of these here this morning. We'll start with Moses. Moses endured repeated grumbling and complaining and outright defiance from the Israelites. And... We see here in Exodus chapter 14, for example, right out of the box, they had just been delivered from Egypt. God had caused all these plagues to come on the Egyptians, and they were no doubt exhilarated to be leaving, and right off the bat, they come to the Red Sea. They can't get anywhere, and then here comes Pharaoh's army, and oh no, we're dead. And we see how they reacted in verse 10 of Exodus 14, that when Pharaoh and his forces drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and they, they saw the Egyptians marching towards them, and they were terrified. And they cried out to the Lord. And they, they didn't just cry out for help. I mean, they were upset. And they complained to Moses. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you had to take us away to die out here in the desert? Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you when we were in Egypt? We told you so. Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been, would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And they're not talking about any, just any death. They're talking about getting slaughtered. And this goes back to the complaint that they lodged before the plagues and the miracles that God performed 
even took place. And they were already uh, having to make bricks and uh, were slaving away. And then Pharaoh made it even more difficult for them when Moses appealed on their behalf to let them go. And uh, he made it more difficult by not supplying the, the straw that they, they needed. Uh, which sort of served as a rebar, if you will, for cement. And it says in verse 19 of Exodus 5 that the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, you shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. And then they, uh, they met uh, Moses and, and Aaron saying, um, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh. They despise us now. They hate us and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. This is just making things worse. Well, we see how the Lord turned that around. But the first sign of trouble, as they left Egypt, they fell apart. You know, our natural inclination is to expect the worst, right? Isn't that just part of our sin nature? Later in the next chapter, they were delivered from that Miraculously, by the way, what did God do? He parted the Red Sea, and they escaped. And so that, that was fantastic. But then later, they, they come in, in chapter 15 to a body of water known as Mara, but they couldn't drink it. The water was nasty. And yet God performed a miracle there so that they had uh, fresh water to drink. But their reaction was, what shall we drink? In verse 24 of Exodus 15. Then again, they just, they, they complained there. We got to die of thirst. And then in the next chapter, they were hungry. And we read in verse 2 that Israel complained against Moses and against Aaron once again. And you, you just see this, this overreaction on their part. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and we had bread to the full. You know, all they were doing was complaining because of their misery when they were there. This is so ironic. You bring us out here into the desert just to kill us with hunger. We're going to starve to death. Well, what did the Lord do on that occasion? He supplied manna. And then the next chapter again, there's no water. How do they reply? At this point, you think, okay, God's going to provide, right? You think, hey, this is just another trial. God's going to come through for us. And instead, they say, give us water that we may drink. Exodus 17, verse 2. Moses says, why do you contend with me? Why, why do you test the Lord? And again in verse 3, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? It's like it never ends. They complain again. They react the same way again and again. But once again, the Lord provided them with water. This is where water came out of the, the rock. And then at Mount Sinai, we see where they uh, react uh, to the Lord and his presence rather than falling down in worship after the Lord had given them the Ten Commandments. Uh, he displays his power to Israel. We see this given at the end of uh, chapter 20, where it says in verse 18, all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And again, they were fearful they were terrified of this, and they say to Moses, You speak with us. We will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. They were frightened. Here's the one who had been rescuing them and saving them. They thought he was just going to up and kill them. You would think that they would be intimidated into obeying this powerful God, right? But no, just a few chapters later in chapter 32, what do you find them doing? They erect a golden calf to worship. And the calf was representative of a, a young bull in Egypt, which was a symbol of virile power. And yet one of the plagues was just that. God destroyed their livestock. 
if you remember that, to show his power over their gods. And that was one of them. And it just seems ridiculous that, that Israel reverts to worshiping a deity which God had overpowered. That makes sense. And yet this nonsense occurs repeatedly. We see the people complain in Numbers chapter 11. And there it's not specified what their complaint was about, but it displeased the Lord. And uh, we see where he sent a fire to consume some of those who grumbling. You know, God hates complaining. He despises it. And then later it refers to the mixed multitude. This refers to some of the people in Egypt who joined with Israel. After the plagues and everything hit, they were like, we're not staying here. We're going with you guys. You have the blessing. But then they were complaining about the food that they had. They even complained about the manna. Look at verse 6 of Numbers 11. Our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Ouch. They're going to complain about the manna? Supernatural, miraculous food that God was providing for them to sustain them while they were wandering in the desert? And they were complaining about it. And, and Moses, he just became overwhelmed with all of this. We read in uh, verse 10, of Numbers 11, that when Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, that the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused, and Moses also, he became displeased. He just got tired of the whole situation. They just complain, 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 complain. No end to it. And he complains to God, Why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive these people? Are these my kids? Are they my responsibility? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Why was I given this task? Where am I going to get meat to give all these people? For they weep over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I may not be able, I may not able to, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, Lord, just why don't you just kill me here and now? Get it over with. If, you, if I really have found favor in your sight, be merciful and just take me out. Do not let me see my wretchedness. Moses became extremely discouraged. They just repeatedly failed. They complained. They even rebelled. We also read later on where they just, at times, they wanted to stone Moses. Um, they, they did this in particular when they sent the 12 spies in to survey the land of Canaan. And then they came back with a report about the menacing people and they were too strong. And so they gave in to their fear. And then we read where they, they just wanted to uh, stone Moses and set up another leader. Have somebody else who would uh, lead them. We see that in Numbers 14 and verse 4. Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And Moses even said, you know, they, they just, they, they want to stone us. I feel for Moses. You know, when God first approached him, Moses wanted out. He said, don't send me. Find somebody else to do this job. And Moses wasn't the only godly man to become discouraged. Joshua, too, became disheartened. After God promised him success in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. That was a great promise coming from God himself. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And of course, their first victory was over what? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, right? That was his great success. And so then after that, they went up against the small town of Ai, and they just sent a contingent of soldiers over there because they figured this is going to be an easy victory. And they lost. It's like, what in the blazes happened? And it says in Joshua 7, 6, that Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on the face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, because they didn't know what happened. They put dust on their heads. 
a, a sign of humility before God. Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Lord, you said you were going to be with us. What about those promises? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. We could have saved ourselves this trouble and stayed over there. Why didn't you just let us settle on the east side of the Jordan River? But the Lord in verse 10 tells Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. They were not supposed to take any of the spoils from the city of Jericho because all of that was devoted unto the Lord. But Achan decided to steal something. And God held the Israelites collectively responsible for that sin. And that was the reason for that. And so there was a valuable lesson here. That is, God's commands are to be taken seriously. Elijah also, though, was another one who became very depressed following his victory on Mount Carmel. You may recall that story in 1 Kings chapter 18. This was Elijah's face-off with the prophets of Baal. And they erected two altars. And the prophets of Baal kept dancing around theirs without success and shouting and calling on their God. No fire came, but then Elijah said a simple prayer which lasted for less than 30 seconds, and boom! Fire consumed the altar, and this was a great success. You would think everybody would then just turn to the Lord. No sooner had he come away from that victory than Jezebel, in chapter 19, took a hit out on him. She wanted to assassinate Elijah. And when he saw that in verse 3 of 1 Kings 19, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which was the town furthest south in the land of Israel, to get away. And then we read later um, in verse 4, in the second part of that verse, he prayed that he might die. He was there sitting under a juniper tree. He says, enough already. And remember, he had gone through a time of famine where the Lord God provided for him. He was by the, the Kareth Brook. Then he stayed with the widow at Zarephath. And uh, the Lord looked out for him. But he, he constantly was facing, though, opposition. And he just felt like he was all alone. And he says, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. I'm no better than anybody else. This is like, this is a losing battle. It's hopeless. And he prayed that he might die because nothing had changed. But then the Lord gave him something to eat, and he went on to Mount Horeb, and then he was sleeping in a cave. Then the Lord came to him, asking him in verse 9, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replies in verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And he had been. This is true. But the children of Israel, they've forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left, and they're coming after me. It's like there's no end of it. Even after this great, miraculous fire that you sent to consume the altar, nothing changed. He became despondent. His attitude, what's the use? God encouraged Elisha, or Elijah rather, and refreshed his spirit because God had another mission for the prophet. He then went on from there to anoint Hazael as king over Syria, Jehu over Israel, and Elisha as his successor. Well, then there are some others I just want to share with you. Hezekiah was another one who in Isaiah chapter 38 was told that he was going to die his days had been numbered, and we read in verse 2 of, of Isaiah 38, where Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. He just cried out to God, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and have done what is good and right in your sight. Now, he was not boasting like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. He was, this was an honest confession. He was a righteous king. He trusted in the Lord, and he loved God. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. 
Well, the Lord honored that. He sent Isaiah back to him and said that he would extend his life by another 15 years. And as proof of that, the shadow for the sundial actually went backward, kind of like a clock moving backward, where the sun was actually shining down on it. You actually saw the, the shadow there. And so that was a miraculous sign to show that Hezekiah would continue to live. Job is one who certainly had good reason to feel discouraged, right? Discouragement is probably putting it mildly. Job had been hammered by God, and then he was badgered by his friends, who were no encouragement at all. They were there to comfort Job, and all they did was blame him for his trouble. And Job, in Job chapter 9, he answered and said, he's answering Bildad, who earlier had said, um, Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. And Job replies, Truly I know it is so. Yeah, I know this. But how can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. How can anyone make a case before the Lord for their righteousness? In verse 14, he says, How then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? How can I make my case? How can I justify myself? How can I de defend myself? For though I were righteous, I could not answer him. Instead, I would have to beg mercy. If I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice, for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. Why, why should he? What, what could I really say? He will not allow me to catch my breath, but fills me with bitterness. If it is a matter of strength, indeed, he is strong. And if of justice, who will appoint my day in court? He is the God who is just. He is the God who is right. Though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. So Job knew that he could not defend himself before the Lord, even though he lived a righteous life. Still, he recognized he was sinful. And Job says, I, I despise my life. And this is what he says in verse 21. I despise my life. That's someone who's very discouraged. He has become despondent. It's where someone thinks that everything is futile. In other words, what's the point? What else could he do? Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And in Jeremiah chapter 20... And in verse 7, this was at a low point in his prophetic career. O Lord, he says, you induced me and I was persuaded. What's he talking about there? Well, if you go back to the very beginning of Jeremiah, we see where the Lord came to him in verse 4 and in verse 5 of the first chapter, Jeremiah says, well, this is God speaking to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And he said, Lord, nobody's going to listen to me. I'm just, I'm a kid. I'm too young. He says, don't say you're, you're a youth. You're just a child. Because you're going to go to all whom I send you. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord says, I will deliver you. But here in verse 7 of Jeremiah 20, he says, You're stronger than I and have prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. I am ridiculed. I'm a laughing stock. Everyone makes fun of me. Nobody listens. And they didn't either. He suffered a lot of persecution. And the details of this are, are given, the things that happened to him, the times that he was locked up, put in the stocks. And verse 14, it just he felt this overwhelming discouragement in Jeremiah 20. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. The day of my birth. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, 
You have a boy. He said, let that man be like the cities which God overthrew and did not relent. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon because he did not kill me from the womb. I should have been aborted. That my mother might have been my grave and her womb always enlarged with me. I should never have come out. I should have just stayed in my mother's womb. Why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame? Jeremiah wishes that he had just died, that he was stillborn. And yet he was appointed as a prophet by God, but even he reached a very dark and discouraging and depressing state in life. It's not worth it. Why did God appoint me to do this? I'm accomplishing nothing. You know, not that Jesus himself became discouraged, but Isaiah wrote of the Messiah that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And even Jesus bemoaned in Matthew 17, 17, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Our Lord became weary. The Apostle Paul had good reasons to become discouraged at times. He ran into constant roadblocks, obstacles, opposition, persecution, many beatings. One time he was stoned in Lystra. He was left for dead. He was abandoned by those that he trusted. He experienced heartbroken disappointment by those he loved. It never ended with him. You know, this continued with Paul until finally he had his head removed. One might say, hey, Paul, why don't you just quit? Even people in the churches just don't seem to be making any progress. But Paul was encouraged here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4, where he said, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation, even in spite of everything that is going through. Paul had praise for the Corinthians. Because of the news that he had heard regarding their spiritual well-being. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside, he said, were conflicts. And that's what Paul ex ex expected. Paul's ministry was very arduous. It was never easy. And the outside conflicts that he speaks of were, was the, the persecution that he received which he was accustomed to, the harassment from those who despise Christ and despise Christians. It's the inside which troubled him more, and that is the burden for the saints that he loved. Their love for the Lord, their walk with Christ. John MacArthur in his comment commentary, he wrote that there are few things in life more painful than broken relationships. Shattered marriages, wayward children, and disrupted friendships produce intense suffering and deep sorrow. And Paul experienced this in droves, unfortunately. We read here in 2, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. And this was his very last inspired letter to Timothy. He writes, be diligent to come to me quickly. He wanted Tim to hurry to get to him. For Demas has forsaken me. This is one of his buddies. This was a friend of his, having loved this present world, and he took off for Thessalonica. But Crescens for Galatia and Titus for Dalmatia, they were actually sent out on, on mission, so they didn't abandon him. But still, he's pointing out that he's all, all alone, except he said, only Luke is with me. And then he wanted him to, to bring Mark along. Um, but then in verse 14, we read, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And then verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Yow. They just left him. Paul was deeply hurt. Paul was deeply hurt by a lot of people. That would have been enough probably to make a number of us just throw in the towel and give up. And yet Paul is the one who wrote, do not lose heart. 
And as we go back to 2 Corinthians 7, he writes here, Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast. He uses the word downcast, which means depressed. He became discouraged, he became depressed, but as MacArthur wrote again, proving to be an example to the flock, admonishing the unruly, encouraging the faint of heart and helping the weak, all takes their toll. And what broke Paul's heart the most was being deeply wounded by those he loved, those he trusted in the church. That hurt more than anything. In his introduction to 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote of the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. So Paul experienced that. And so Paul, he was downcast, meaning he was depressed. And this is what the word means, but God comforted him through the arrival of Titus. This is what we read in verse 6. He comforted us by the coming of Titus. In other words, he arrived with good news, a word of encouragement about the Corinthian saints. You know, all of this serves to point out that even the stalwarts of the faith struggled with discouragement. They became depressed. And at times even filled with despair. They were not immune to the circumstances of life which can wear us down. And it seems to be unrelenting, right? One thing right after another. It just goes and goes and goes. You keep taking the hits. The psalmist is dealing with discouragement and with bouts of depression in Psalm 42. This is what Glenn read part of this psalm for our scripture reading this morning and we sang this for our doxology. He opens up by writing, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God and the living God. And it becomes evident as to why he's longing for God, because my tears have been my food day and night, and while they continually say to me, Where is your God? We don't know what the trouble was that this psalmist was experiencing, but it, he was going through a rough patch in life. Where's your God, they say, those who don't believe. He felt weak. And he writes, when shall I come and appear before God? He desires God, and we see where it's just intense because tears have been his food. He thirsts for God, the living God. And when it says, come and appear, the Septuagint and the Syriac texts uh, read this, see the face of God. I believe here the psalmist actually wanted to be brought into God's presence. In other words, Lord, take me out of this world. Get me out of here. This would have been reflected by Paul in Philippians 1.21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to go be with the Lord. In verse 9, he asks the, the question, Why have you forgotten me? That's what it felt like felt like in his life. Three times in this psalm, he uses the word cast down, which is one word in the Hebrew, and it means depressed. He was depressed. And then we see in, in verse 5, and again in verse 11, where he uses the word disquieted. We also see this written in 43, verse 5. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? The word disquieted means to, to, to moan, loud, loud groaning, to cry aloud from your pain, being distressed, just being, being emotionally upset, hurting he was despondent. He was expressing his agony. But what was his answer? What was the antidote to all of this discouragement, depression, despondency? He writes, hope in God. Hope in God. Well, how does that help? What does that mean? It means to rest securely in God's love his sovereignty, and his faithfulness. You know, the Israelites encountered problem after problem after problem, trouble after trouble after trouble. 
Did God ever fail them? Never. Not once did he let them down. Hope in God. To hope in God means to have the assurance in your heart of God's presence, of his provision, and his protection in life. Because he is here. For believers, we have the greatest assurance knowing that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. God is with us constantly. He is present in our life. Can there be any better solution than that? You don't need medication for depression or finding a bottle of booze to drown your sorrows in or forget about your problems. The scripture's answer is to hope in God. For me, one of the most uh, meaningful passages I find in scripture are the words of the Lord Jesus that he gave to Martha after her brother had passed away. You know, I think about the situation in that household because it was just Lazarus and his sisters Martha and Mary. It was just the three of them that, that lived together. So the loss of their brother, that was, that was a big thing. That, that was just a, a terrible loss because it was just the three of them. That, they, they were a household. They were a family. They were together all the time. And she just was extraordinarily sad, filled with grief. But I want to close with Christ's comforting words and words of assurance that he gave to her in John 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were to die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he asked her that question. Do you believe this? Is this where your hope lies? Is this where you have your trust? And I ask you this morning, does your hope rest in this truth? Is this your foundation? Is this where your heart is anchored? Because it's the greatest comfort and assurance and source of peace that anyone can have in this world. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your word that you have given to us this morning. I pray, Lord God, that we may find what you give to us, what you have given to us. Lord, your medication, your, your antidote, as it were, to resolve the problems that we run into, which are based on circumstances. And we can see Israel, they looked at the circumstances rather than looking to God. And they were overwhelmed with fear rather than responding with faith and with hope and with the recognition that you were present, that you would take care of them. Lord, may we live in that way. Lord, I ask that you will develop that in our lives because you are faithful. Your presence is a constant thing. You are our shepherd. We are your sheep. We're your lambs. You're our father. We're your children. Lord God, may we rest secure in these truths. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.